Welcome to Web3 and Whiskey, a podcast about how the decentralized internet will change our lives. In each episode, we react to a future when users and communities have all of the power and when digital lives could be more vibrant than real life. And we drink whiskey while doing it. I'm your host, Gary Liu. And as always, I'm joined by Suresh Balaji, founder of the Web3 Marketing Association, and Malcolm Ong, a product leader and serial entrepreneur. And we also have our producer, Disco Wolf, or as we call him, D-Dubs. He's here to fact check us and to judge our opinions. If D-Dubs likes what we say, you will hear. And if he dislikes our opinion, you will hear. All right. He's going to judge us and he's going to judge us fast. He's going to judge us mean. Quick disclaimer, we don't show projects in this podcast. So consider any excitement you hear from us to be personal opinion. And our opinions should not be taken as investment advice of any kind. It's good to be back with you guys, gentlemen. By the way, we, we're still relatively early in this process. We've like recorded uh, three proper podcasts, a couple of other tests before that. So at least I'm still new to it. I know, Suresh, you have a lot more experience than the rest of us. I've been listening back to some of the early ones. Actually, I, I've been listening back to all of them. I have a weird podcast voice, and I don't like it. And I'm trying to talk normally now, which I'm already feeling like if I'm failing just because the microphone's in front of me. I don't know if any of you guys are feeling that as well. I think, uh, Gary, you, you get into sort of teacher mode sometimes. You know what? I was about to say that. Every time you bring up teacher and professor, it's never... It's never a compliment. When you use the word <laughs> professor or teacher, it's not a compliment. I appreciate it. I'll take the feedback. Uh, I'm going to try and speak more normally today. Speaking of today, we are in this podcast going to try and debunk the biggest myths about NFTs. And of course, NFTs as a primary building block of Web3 uh, is a technology that is important to understand. So we'll do our very best in today's main topic, to try and debunk the myths that all of us have heard about NFTs. But let's start with our whiskeys, gentlemen. So I'm going to start with Suresh, who is joining us from quarantine. Welcome back to Hong Kong, by the way. And uh, tell us what you're drinking in quarantine. Hong Kong, so happy to be here. So I bought myself uh, a whiskey on the way here. Uh, it's called Five Brothers, and I never had it before. Apparently, it's a new one. Um, it's uh, Five Brothers who founded the Heavenly Hill distillery in the US. And uh, this was this was an homage to them. Uh, Shapira Brothers, apparently, it's not a it's not a very expensive whiskey, but it's, it's pretty good. It doesn't have aging on it. But it but it's sort of I just tried a sip earlier, it, it feels like, a, you know, maybe seven, eight, 10 year old whiskey. Um, it, it also got it's got a bit of spicy notes to it. And it sort of had an orange zesty finish. I don't know why. But wow. uh, hey, um, yeah, really nice. Five brothers. Yeah, it's a new one. Thank you, Suresh. And Malcolm, what are you drinking today? Uh, today I got a singleton from the Glendullen Distillery. This is the Master's Art uh, version, finished in musket casks. Singleton is single malts, scotch. Uh, this one from Speyside. But I believe there's a lot of singletons that are out there, um, so it might be a little bit confusing. This one's specifically from the Glendullen Distillery. The nose is a little bit pear. I taste a little bit of a toffee, chocolatey, slight citrus uh, finish to that. Very smooth. Very good. Very nice. I see that whiskey rock in your glass. Well done on a hot Hong Kong day. All right. I actually have a very familiar whiskey today. Not one of the independent bottles I usually bring. So this is the Macallan, the Macallan 18. Um, probably one of, if not the most famous scotches in the world. Um, McKellen's a huge distillery. Uh, they opened their new distillery in 2019. They're already huge beforehand, 2019 specifically, after a massive building process that cost over 200 million bucks. They opened a brand new distillery and now have 36 stills running. Uh, so pr huge production, very, very famous, great marketers. Uh, one thing that people may not know about McKellen 18 is that there are actually several different expressions of Macallan 18, even though it is probably one of the most famous original bottlings. Uh, they are still different. So most Macallan 18s, in fact, Macallan throughout its history, historically, have uh, aged all of their whiskeys in sherry casks. 
Um, so heavily sherried whiskeys generally, but over the course of the last 20 years, uh, McAllen has been producing more and more non sherried whiskeys. So uh, there are now McAllen 18s out there, um, annual releases that are not sherried. But this, this is one of the traditional uh, Spanish sherry cast McAllen 18. So always consistent, doesn't matter what year you buy it. It's always consistent. You can always smell the spice from the sherry cask. Just a big, bold uh, flavor, which is bigger than most Speyside whiskeys. McKellen is, it's just clean water, a little bit of moss, but definitely a lot of the spice from, from the sherry cask. So lovely drum. All right, gentlemen. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. Drink up. Cheers. Ah, delicious. Good start to the afternoon. Before we get to our main discussion... Let's get some reactions to the news. I'm going to turn over to D-Dubs. What do you have for us this week? Hey, I've got five news items for everyone today. Number one is about Telegram, wanting to add Web3 to its platform. Malcolm, what do you think? Yeah, this is interesting. Um, a little bit of history here. I think Telegram previously had a layer one blockchain project called the Telegram Open Network, T-O-N. But the SEC actually made it, uh, Telegram abandon this project. Uh, due to some you know, regulatory issues. And so after that, independent groups took over. They now call it the open network, uh, still T-O-N. Um, and what they've done is actually they've created this new domain name service or DNN, D DNS. You know, you're basically the, the URLs uh, or the website names that you have, and you can create um, custom versions of those. And they made it similar to what the ENS, Ethereum naming service has done. So you may have seen on Twitter or whatnot, a lot of people having you know, your name dot ETH or something like that. Um, they've done the same thing. You can have any name dot ton, right? T-O-N. Now, because of this and the success of this, Telegram now, you know, sees the potential of integrating these domain names into their app. So then imagine you could uh, use your Telegram name, make it and mint it on chain, and that would resolve to a wallet address. So in the future, that might mean you can do things like sending crypto directly to your Telegram contact or your friend, all within the Telegram app. So I think this is this is cool. This is interesting. Um, looking, you know, forward to to seeing how this progresses. I just want to build on that, right? I think there is Telegram's definitely become a platform for Web three communities. I mean, this is pre Discord days. Um, you know, communities needed a place to be. Um, but the, the flip side of it is, you know, this lack of moderation. There is literally no censorship. There is no controls. It really makes a happy place for lots of bad actors. And the last count, they had 700 million plus users. That's that's quite a big following, right? And I I, I remember just like when WhatsApp started, uh, they said, hey, no advertising. We won't use your data for anything, et cetera, et cetera. I think Telegram's founders said the same thing. And um, now I'm guessing at some point they need to think about what other revenue can come through if it's not advertising revenue, if it's not utilizing data for targeting, et cetera. So my, my hunch is... Uh, when they build the ton coin, uh, the T O N, the 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 open network coin, uh, it is probably a bit to create their own balance sheet, which is not a bad idea, right? In some ways, monetizing it would mean there will be uh, dollars available for innovating more. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how they how they keep that going and ensure that it doesn't become um, it just suddenly jumps into this big bandwagon of Web three domain names and you know tries to it's 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 a sort of a you know, not necessarily a natural place for them. Yeah, I, I do think this is about revenue. So I agree with you on that, Suresh. But I think it's a revenue play trying to masquerade as a decentralized identity play. Now, I personally think decentralized identity, which we have kind of touched on in this podcast, but not enough, is going to be very important for the future. But remember, Telegram is a heavily centralized platform. Now, it happens to be a centralized platform that has ethos, right? Um, you know, not using, not, not having advertising, not using your data in, in nefarious ways as compared to other uh, social media messaging platforms. Um, and all the messages are encrypted and whatnot. That's why Telegram has been heavily adopted by the blockchain community, but it's still centralized. And so if you take a decentralized domain or username and you attach it to your Telegram account, you've effectively made your decentralized ID centralized again. So uh, that's my take on it. It'll be interesting to see how they handle it. Um, if they really do say that, you know, it's it's connected, but at any point in time when you pull it, there's going to be zero connection between your centralized account and the decentralized um, 
uh, identity and uh, everything is going to be really strongly hashed and securitized. Well, all of these things uh, is going to, all of these tiny details will make a difference into, I think, what the community eventually thinks about this, this tie up. Okay, number two item of the day. Tencent has received a patent to use blockchain for missing persons notices. Malcolm. Um, yeah, I think this is interesting for two reasons. Maybe one um, on the patent side, the fact that they've patented this technology. Uh, you know, you can kind of imagine um, where they might take things with WeChat or whatnot and implementing it within WeChat. Um, but then number two, with the missing persons piece, uh, I don't know how big of a problem uh, this is in, in China. Um, but the fact that they're using this uh, use case with missing persons. But I think what's what's most interesting to see here is that we have a Chinese tech giant adopting you know new technologies such as blockchain for real world use cases, um, and it's happening today, right? So uh, I'm excited to see uh, Chinese tech giants doing that. Um, and then and this is this is a pattern that they've done. They they, they tend to uh, adopt these te- uh, technologies much earlier than say the rest of the world. And so it's just very interesting to see this um, being brought to the to the masses um, a lot um, faster than you would imagine. This is this is where the intersection of technology meets uh, life. I think any any use of technology that can solve for problems that we have as human beings is a technology that's going to win. It's not technology for technology's sakes, but there is some some eventual utility value for the community. Um, what I'm not sure is are they doing this on behalf of um, law enforcement? Are they doing this on behalf of the government? How will this get? What's, what's in it for Tencent? And how are they going to eventually use it? I mean, the, the, the amazing part about this is, uh, well, this, these tokens can then probably uh, get to being connected to sort of, maybe there are tokens, maybe it's, it's soul bound. Um, I, I love that uh, white paper on soul bound tokens. I think we should talk about it in a, one of the subsequent podcasts. The whole idea of uh, digital one digital identity per human, and and therefore connections, traceability, certificates, all of those in one place, uh, which essentially is you can essentially where we're getting to is generating the biggest decentralized database of human beings of this planet, which is fabulous. Uh, maybe we should add animals too, but I think it's a, it's a great step. I love it. Yeah, to answer Malcolm's question, it is a big problem in China. China has a significant missing persons issues, uh, especially child kidnappings and disappearances. They've been consistently a national issue, a national tragedy since the 1980s in China, with some estimates suggesting that about 70,000 kids are kidnapped every single year. Now, in the last decade, the Chinese government has actually significantly ramped up efforts to not only stop the trend, but to recover and reunite kidnapped kids, which some of them are now adults, with their uh, birth families. Because of the sheer size of the country, and of course its massive population, 1.4 billion like we all know, the actual recovery efforts are difficult. Um, it's really hard to identify and find missing persons in, uh, in China uh, because the efforts are actually highly fragmented. Most of these records are actually still housed at local police stations and police databases uh, that belong to the child's hometown. Or original hometown. So as, as with most of these kidnappings, the kids are shipped off to different provinces. And, and so if the database is only localized. It's just really difficult. There are a lot of documentaries out there, by the way, um, that, that one should watch if you're interested about these efforts and about how hard it is, how tough it is for parents to effectively canvas the entire country throughout a lifetime trying to find their kidnapped child. So the idea that blockchain can come and potentially solve this issue and track these efforts transparently at a national scale, I agree. I think it's a great idea. And Tencent, absolutely, they are the uh, the tech giant to execute on this because they own WeChat, and WeChat is by de facto the absolute largest uh, messaging and communications network in all of China at this point. It's effectively 98% penetration of all internet users are on WeChat. So yeah, let's let's watch and see how Tencent Tencent fixes this problem, hopefully. Number three item of the day, Ethereum domain name creation has doubled in the last four months. Suresh. Yeah. So, hey, uh, Gary and I were chatting about this the other day, right? Search engines kill the need for people to remember or type domain names. Right? 
I remember as a marketer trying to have the crispiest, shortest, smartest domain name so that I could put on a billboard, uh, hoping that somebody would go and type it out. And uh, Google changed it all, and you know, and and Baidu changed it all, right? So, but looks like there has been a resurgence of domain names with Web three. Uh, Web three domain names companies wear Web three domain names as a badge of honor. Uh, so when we were looking for a domain for uh, Web three marketing association, we hunted down X Y Z, which seems like you know uh, the the home. Uh, there is of course a dot coin, dot bit, dot Bitcoin, dot crypto. All of these domain names booming right now because it feels like the, the you know uh, Web three companies feel that the, these domain names give them legitimacy. Uh, so much so that Unstoppable Domains last funding round made it a unicorn. So hey, uh, more to come. Uh, I'm just not sure why there is this big resurgence, but there is. So there are two points here. One about the rise of ENS, which I think is awesome, right? Because again, decentralized identity. This is a piece of decentralized identity. Um, so it, 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 you know, it doesn't surprise me that more and more people as crypto adoption, Web3 adoption increases, have decided I want my .eth URL that links to my wallet. Because at, at the end of the day, right, uh, wallets are, are, are part of our decentralized or uh, Web3 identity. The second point, though, back to Suresh, is maybe this is a whole nother topic of discussion. Um, I still don't think that URLs are that important. I think that this is more akin to a username grab than a URL grab. Remember, um, top-level domain companies, whomever owns XYZ, as an example, they are for-profit companies. They spend years trying to uh, get registered, get their uh, top-level domain registered um, and for sale. And so they're trying to generate profit. And so everyone's trying to find a hook. And when XYZ managed to you know, find a Web3 hook, when .io managed to find a Web3 hook, it was great for their businesses. They're going to heavily lean in on it. Uh, I still don't think that it's because in Web3, a URL is more important. It's just that Web3 has invented a bunch of new businesses. And for most of those businesses, .com URLs are already all gone. right? And so the fact that we have another domain extension where we can find that crispy short name um that that's why the prices are, have, have gone through the roof but yeah so i i'm still a little bit suspect on whether or not urls are making a resurgence in importance but from a decentralized id perspective it totally makes sense that ens is uh, is growing so fast yeah i think i agree here that maybe urls are not really making a resurgence but this uh makes sense that ens you know is, is doubling in terms of demand because uh, it's similar to the land grab that did happen during web one domain names and similar to a land grab that happened, you know, when you're saving usernames on, you know, Twitter, et cetera. So, uh, what's even more interesting though, is are the lots of, you know, groups of people that are squatting on these, um, in, you know, with the purpose of actually selling them later. Um, so that is another reason why you're seeing this, this, uh, huge demand, uh, spike in the last, uh, four to six months. Thanks, Malcolm. Number four item. Martin Shkreli dumps his project's token in a hack. Suresh. Did we not, did we not predict this in one of our previous uh, podcast recordings? Did, folks, you heard it here first. We knew this was going to happen. Yeah, it was one of our, I think it was one of our test podcast recordings. So I'm not sure I'll ever see the light of day. But Suresh, you are right. We did predict it. All three of us said, yeah, this is not going to go well. Um, although I don't know how much credit we should give ourselves for being prescient because it's, it's, it's Screlly, right? Like he's a sleaze ball. I think everyone that read the news predicted it. it's, it's like everyone looking at the, uh, Adam Newman news, he raised a ton of money, uh, and, and, and everyone's now thinking, oh, this is not going to go well. So we'll see whether or not that one turns out uh, to be right or wrong. But I think the story, more importantly, it highlights how the transparency of blockchain means bad actors can't really get away with sketchy things. Well, I, I should say this. They might be able to get away with it, especially pseudonymously. But undoxed, sorry, doxed uh, bad actors can't get away with sketchy things unnoticed. He's trying to claim that he was hacked. It's so clear for anyone that can read a transaction ledger that he dumped the tokens, that the tokens were sold and the money was transferred to a wallet that he himself has funded. It's very clear that he decided to do this. He went out with a press release pumped up the value of a token that, by the way, he didn't even issue. He just kind of adopted that token for his project uh, just to drive the value of the token up and then dumped his share, made half a million dollars, and uh, who knows what other scam he's going to pull next. 
nothing to really say here. Not really surprised. Um, he is who he is. So let's just move on. All right, let's move on. Final news item, Nike's NFT revenue surpasses $185 million, positioning it as the biggest earning brand from NFTs. I think this is fan-freaking-tastic. We have been trying to make the case on this podcast that Gen Zs are going to own more and more digital assets and that these big brands, retail brands, they, they got to get in on it. They, they have a huge opportunity, right? Because this is not a fad. This next generation are going to live their lives in the digital world. They're going to want to spend their money in a digital way for digital things. Um, and this is a great example of it. It shows that there is already a market. So for me, I think this is great. Onwards to Web3 future, everything we're talking about, it's all going to come true, folks. Yeah, I think, Gary, you're right. This is super exciting. Um, this, though, right, Nike is a little bit of an outlier here because they acquired a company that was somewhat successful already called Artifact, R-T-F-K-T. And that company was already doing $70 million in sales volume and $4 million in revenue. But Nike was smart, right? They realized that there was this existing company and brand that was doing something relatively well. And so they wanted to take advantage of that, someone to, to piggyback on their community, but then, of course, bring it to their own, to Nike's own uh, user base. So when they acquired this company, it was rumored at a $100 million acquisition. It's actually not disclosed. But since then, Artifact has done $1.2 billion in sales volume and $185 million in revenue. So if they did acquire them for $100 million, this, is, this has been a great, great investment, right? But in comparison, the number two, or what we think is the number two brand here is D&G, Dolce & Gabbana. And they've done $25 million in revenue. So very, very huge gap between what Nike has, has done with you know, 185 compared to, to DNG. But I think what was really interesting and smart on Nike's part is they recognize the value here of NFTs for their particular audience, right? A lot of them are streetwear collectors, um, uh, fashion aficionados, et cetera. Um, and beyond you know, general speculation in the NFT market, they actually came out with a lot of utility behind this. They actually came out with ways to really engage uh, the community and the, and the crowd. So um, they came out with a project called Crypto Kicks, which is sort of like you know virtual sneakers. They let people customize these. They have this other thing called AR Hoodie, which was sort of like a physical digital, you know what we call digital uh, sort of item where you can mint it, uh, but you can actually get the physical hoodie as well. Um, and like I said, executing community strategy very well. If you pay attention to some artifacts, um, NFT projects like, uh, such as Clone X, they've uh, done a great job in their Discord channels and through their other marketing channels on, you know, really engaging the community. So, so job well done, I think, here with uh, Nike. Yeah, absolutely, right. I think we need more and more mainstream brands coming here uh, so that we can, and everyone's experimenting, which is a good, which is good news. Um, Tiffany was number three after Dolce Gabbana, I think, and, there, and then the whole list follows. And a couple of fascinating things. One is, because of the transparent nature of NFT sales that anyone can see, um, we know that these are true revenues, right? These are not somebody's made-up revenues. You, you can see them all on all all the all the transfers can be seen on EtherScan, which is number one, which is great. The the second interesting point here is, um, the is this experiment going to stretch? Uh, to Gary's point, will this become a sizable business for the next generation? For Nike, is a big question mark. Um, you know, $185 million is a drop in the ocean in the $50 billion uh, revenue line that Nike has uh, globally. And if they're able to stretch this, create more product lines, create more, um, you know, NFTs of sorts or, or combined with combined with their sort of regular hoodies, regular shoes, maybe there is a, there is a play here. Uh, the most interesting part to this is I was wondering what, why is Dolce & Gabbana a far second versus Nike so far ahead. And maybe we, we, we in this podcast, we talk about community a lot. And I think there is maybe there was an inherent community waiting to receive these. And um, that, that's probably that's probably where it all starts. Uh, may, perhaps I'm just thinking of Nike's community versus DNG's community versus Tiffany's community. Uh, where are those communities? And are brands with inherently strong uh, communities, will they be super successful? Are they the lowest hanging fruit uh, from a Web3 perspective? Question mark, but, but that's the hypothesis. Thanks, Suresh, and everyone else for your reactions to the news. 
Now back to Gary to introduce our main topic of the day. Our main topic for today's podcast is about NFTs. And specifically, we are here to try and debunk some of the myths that we've all heard about NFTs. Uh, as I said up front, NFTs are really the key building block um, to our Web3 world. These are, uh, these are assets that can be owned, can be scarce in the digital world. And because they can be scarce and they can have intrinsic value, that's why there is overall value in Web3. That's why we believe that decentralized internet is going to build up uh, into a real economy. Um, but there are a lot of myths because we hear a lot about NFTs. We hear about how expensive they are. We hear about these ridiculous transaction volumes, especially from early 2021 to early 2022 before the crypto crash. And I think they're easy things to make fun of. Um, and it really is. I mean, there, there's some ridiculous numbers and stories out there. Um, and because of that, I think in general, uh, a lot of folks don't pay attention to the nuances and the details of exactly what NFTs are, the purposes that they sell for. Uh, and they don't consider the opportunities um, in the future for NFT technology. And so we kind of just land on these derivative, reductive assumptions about NFTs. And that's why there are all these myths. Now, for our audience specifically for uh, Web3 and Whiskey, understanding the NFT is extremely important. If we're talking about enterprises and companies moving into the Web3 world, a Nike, as an example, moving into the Web3 world, it all starts with NFTs. This is IP in the digital world, how to uh, protect it, how to express it, how to monetize it, how to take advantage of it and use it to build fascinating new worlds uh, and new communities. So that is our job today is to talk through some of these key myths and do our very best to explain them and to debunk them. The first one that we're going to address, NFTs are just JPEG art. So effectively, I think when somebody says, oh, NFTs are just JPEG art, to me, it means that they're saying, oh, NFTs are useless, right? NFTs are not really an asset. NFTs uh, are a commodity. NFTs are just JPEG art. Suresh, I'm going to throw it over to you. What do you think about this? This is the first myth ever, right? I think everyone thinks, oh, why pay for, you know, thousands of dollars for a JPEG of an ape or a monkey or a or a bird. This is where this is where the reductionist view doesn't work. And uh, let me try and elaborate what what all the things that can be and all the use use cases that we can see. Uh, NFTs intrinsically are built with the same cryptographic technology that we that is used for Bitcoin on any blockchain, right? So essentially, NFTs hold smart contracts. That's what differentiates them from any other token. Well, tokenization existed in the Web 1 world, Web 2 world. But here we call them non-fungible tokens because of the fact that the, the technology exists, which gives them uniqueness and immutability, right? And this is what gives rise to a whole host of use cases. Firstly, yes, JPEG art, which is probably where it started. And, and why is this interesting? Because, uh, well, art, great art, is or or what we call great art uh, is expensive um, because of authenticity we know that a famous artist created it because of ownership record we can go back in time and say hey who are all the people who own this piece of art and and you know sort of provenance in terms of you know where did it originally come from and 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 uh, what's his history been and and the beauty of nfts is any JPEG, which has now been minted, so they say, uh, has all of these uh, elements of authenticity, provenance, uh, ownership records, trackability, traceability, uh, and availability in 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 in, in the transparent, um, you know, blockchain world, so to speak. So, which is why, which is why that that JPEG becomes unique, and which is why it is just not a useless JPEG, but it has got intrinsic value to it. Uh, but interestingly, I mean, there are other use cases that 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 probably the top ones. There are hundreds of them, but maybe the top two or three. Um, I mean, NFTs, anything that that needs uniqueness, anything that needs, uh, you know, that that ability to keep a record. I mean, things like tickets. Uh, uh, if t uh, if tickets become NFTs, uh, it can prevent counterfeits. It can be connected to one one wallet. You know, uh, secondary sales becomes easier. Um, NFTs can be used for in-game assets. Uh, the, the point that we spoke about, you know, um, RTFKT and Nike NFT, the whole idea is, you know, can this Nike hoodie be interoperable between 
um, you know, the various metaverses that exist now. And can you wear the same hoodie in, you know, Sandbox and Decentraland and things like that? That's possible because it's your hoodie and you have it. And it, when, when interoperability happens, that, that NFT can move across spaces. Um, and there is definitely a hype beh behind art, but, but there is uh, there's way many more use cases that we can talk about. I can keep going on, uh, but it's definitely, as we see, the starting point is art. The starting point are seemingly, um, you know, speculative, useless JPEGs, uh, but the underlying technology and all of the use cases are coming to life now, and it's going to be, NFTs are going to live a long life. I think there's something that we have to clarify here. The NFT itself, the token itself, is a smart contract. Um, and just like tokens, any even fungible tokens on a composable um, blockchain like Ethereum, these are smart contracts. And and the NFT itself is a certificate that points to some underlying asset. And that asset, most of the time, is stored decentrally, right? So it's actually a JPEG or some other media that is stored on decentralized servers, something like Filecoin or IPFS. So the NFT is just a certificate with a smart contract that points to and says uh, this thing. Here, here's, my, here's the data that I have about who owns this thing that I'm pointing to. So there's an underlying asset. Uh, obviously, for the sake of simplicity, when we are talking about NFTs, what we're actually doing is we're talking about the actual smart contract itself and the underlying asset together as one unit. But technically speaking, the token itself is just the certificate. So just the premise of this myth, NFTs are just JPEG art. By, by, by definition, it's incorrect uh, because uh, the JPEG is a JPEG. <laughs> it just happens to be a JPEG that is decentrally um, saved or stored, and it has a certificate of authenticity and scarcity um, tied to it. So important clarification. Oh, I got my first ding. That's a big moment for me. Um, Malcolm, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on this because uh, Suresh brought up a bunch of use cases for NFTs. So it's not just about earn anymore. It's, it's about access. It's about community and whatnot. Tell us a little bit about your experiences with NFTs being more than just art. Yeah, I think we're seeing, you know, just the beginnings of what NFTs can do. And so a lot of that does happen to be art, right? There's this whole profile pick PFP um, trend. So you see board apes, et cetera. Um, but I think what's interesting is that you're starting to also see utility behind these NFTs. And so rather than seeing it as, hey, I'm buying a piece of art, right? I'm, I'm actually buying ownership of the art, which represents a membership into a community. And therefore that membership can then give me utility based on, you know, whatever the community decides to do. So whether that's, you know, take, take, um, proof and moonbirds, right? So there's, there's an entity project out there, proof and moonbirds. Uh, I'm, I'm a moonbirds holder myself. And what's been interesting is they've been able to allow sub communities within their community. So by me holding an NFT, I'm part of the moonbirds community, right? But because of that, and because I own a particular trait within the NFT. So let's say I, I, I have one that has a wizard hat, then I'm actually part of this sub community of wizards, right? Within, within the Moonbirds community. And what um, that is, um, gives me access to is whatever the sub community also does. So for example, when I was at the NFT NYC conference in New York, they had in real life events specifically for that sub community. So specifically for if you hold a, you know, wizard hat Moonbird then we're going to hold this event for you, right? So it almost creates this ability for many different versions of, um, you know, communities and sub-communities within that and membership tiers within a, a particular project. So I, I think that's one aspect of it is thinking about it as, as membership. But then the other aspect of it is also thinking about utility from a technological sense. Suresh mentioned things like ticketing, right? The fact that NFTs are immutable, right? They're, they're sitting on the blockchain, they're verifiable. So then it does create this uh, opportunity to use this technology for things like ticketing to prevent fraud, to prevent counterfeiting. So I think those are the things that we will see in the future, you know, coming, but it just so happens now people are talking about art and JPEG because that's, that's, that's what happened, you know, earlier this year during the, 
the the trend as NFTs um, picked up. Speaking of authentication, uh, it, I'll give an example of authentication in real life using NFTs. There are there there's a a new and growing category of art sculptures that are known as um, like it's called toy art or art toys, right? Um, and you know, Suresh is a big comic book fan, so I know he has toy art or art toys because I've, I've seen them in his house. Um, now, these things, unfortunately, the physical things can be relatively easily replicated because most of them are made from molds. And so you can actually reverse engineer that and you can buy one and create a mold of it and then create many, many other counterfeits. So the, in the toy art world, uh, my understanding is that there is a, a significant counterfeiting problem. But imagine this. Imagine an artist creating a set of 10 uh, of these you know, toy art figurines, and they are the ones that cast it, and it's only 10. And every single one of them has a, a you know, near-field near field communications NFC chip embedded in its base, something that you can't remove, you can't add. Um, and if you scan it, with a phone, it automatically takes you to an NFT, the, the actual certificate that is tied to that unique NFC chip. And that NFC chip is unique. We know that there's no other NFC chip that can replicate its exact same signal and serial number. Um, and it's connected to this certificate, NFT, on the blockchain that cannot be changed, it cannot be replicated, it cannot be faked. So you know when you scan that thing uh, that you, you've bought uh, or you're about to buy, it's authentic. People are doing this, or, or, or luxury brands are now doing this with luxury purses, that there's an NFC chip embedded in the actual purse itself so that you're not buying a fake Prada bag. You're scanning it and you know, actually, I don't know if it's Prada or Chanel, who, who's doing it, but there are a couple of luxury brands who are doing it. So when you scan it, you know that this is an authentic bag. Um, and it's, it's, it's more secure than a paper certificate that we used to keep in our safes. It's more, uh, it's, it's more secure than a centralized database uh, that, frankly speaking, anyone who can hack into a database can actually manipulate these things you can't. All right, let's move on to our second myth. Somewhat associated, but it provides even more texture to exactly what an NFT is. The second myth that all of us have heard is that anybody can copy and save an NFT. Just right-click and save the image. Anybody can copy and save an NFT. Let's go to our technologist, Malcolm. Is this a myth or is this the truth? Yeah, I think similar to what we discussed before, uh, this is a myth because you have to understand in order to right click save and steal this art, right? You have to understand what is the NFT itself and how blockchain works, right? Just as Suresh mentioned, data stored on the blockchain is immutable. So it can't be changed, it can't be re rewritten. And when you're thinking about the NFT, don't think about the actual digital art itself. Don't think about it as the JPEG itself. Think about it as the ownership certificate, that, just like you mentioned, Gary, right? Um, when Prada does this, you know, a, a, a blockchain-based, digital-based version of a paper certificate that we're used, we're used to. So when someone mints an NFT, then they have this record that's verifiable and that's permanent, right? And so you know who minted it, when did they mint it, et cetera. And so who owns this currently? So by, you know, someone out there simply stealing, quote unquote, stealing, right click save my JPEG, it doesn't matter because they can't prove that they own it. They can't go out there and sell it because it's not authentic. And they certainly cannot uh, gain any utility out of it, right? When I have, when I own that actual NFT, then again, I can use that for any utility, just like Moonbirds, for example, any utility that it comes with, but I can actually prove that I own it and therefore I can also sell it if I wanted to, right? So I think that's that's the thing. And, you know, NFT, what NFTs are really about is the ownership of it. Uh, you know, the analogy that people like to also say or uh, use here is like, let's say you, you took your phone, took a photo of the Mona Lisa, like you literally went to Paris and whatnot, took a photo of the Mona Lisa. It doesn't mean that you can take that photo and suddenly sell it for lots of money, or it doesn't mean that's it's the real thing. It's not, right? So it's sort of like that. All right. We're going to get to rights in a minute. And the Mona Lisa is a great example of, uh, of what commercial rights or public domain rights look like. Um, Suresh, have you ever stolen an NFT? Do you plan on stealing an NFT? Hey, um, 
here is here is an interesting thing that happened to me, right? So I bought an NFT, and um, OpenSea uh, suddenly blocked the resale of that NFT uh, because at some point they figured out from a provenance perspective it was a stolen NFT at some point in the past. Um, we spoke about this in our last uh, episode, and I, I, I have a live case example of of how my NFT has been frozen uh, for from the secondary market. So this is this is probably a good thing, right? I mean, of course, I'm I'm an unhappy bunny uh, because the the NFT that I bought uh, was at some point somebody had probably stolen it. But it is interesting to see that you know the there is centralized sort of censorship mechanism or or control mechanism available to solve for this because at least there is a um, there is some sort of linkage back to where the NFT came from and if there was an issue that can that can be raised. So so is that a good is that a good or bad thing, Suresh? Like the the, the fact that there is centralized control that your NFT can be frozen, even though you bought it legally. Yeah. Somebody else acquired it illegally, but you bought it legally. You actually exchanged uh, fiat, real money, right, in crypto. You exchanged real money for this asset that now is suddenly frozen and you can't get access to it. You can't monetize. You can't do anything with it. But this is not very different from what could what would have happened in real world art, right? If there is a, there's a stolen, I mean, let's say that, you know, the Mona Lisa gets stolen and um, Malcolm buys it from uh, from a, from some place, and he pays good money for it. Um, he knows it's the Mona Lisa. He knows that it was stolen, and but but he lands up buying it. He he is he can't own it because the, down the chain it it was not actually traded at some point, right? So so it is interesting that that the world of Web three is coming to terms with what is legal and what is illegal, and it makes it easier in the world of Web three to find provenance uh, and and the and the connection. Uh, than than in the real world, right? I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is a thing. Yeah, I think we have standard norms and and protocols for that already, right? Suresh, like you said, if if someone steals your art and 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 steals a piece of art and then sells it to you, or if someone steals a car and sells you that car, right? At some point, yeah, the government or some entity, centralized entity, can step in and say, "Hey, that thing that you just bought was stolen." You know, we have the right to effectively take it back to its original owner or something like that and maybe compensate you for the trouble. I think that's fair. Um, and I think that, that you know, those things are just going to happen. Um, but in this particular case, it's a little bit different, though, right? I think maybe clarify when I um, was talking about stealing, it's, it's the literal like, hey, me copying the JPEG itself, right? As opposed to hacking into someone's wallet or, or um, attempting to, you know, grab the credentials of their wallet and then actually draining their wallet and stealing their NFTs. I think that's a little bit different. Yeah. So the, the example I've heard, which you brought up, Mona Lisa, uh, it's not just, you know, taking a picture of the Mona Lisa and whether or not it's worth anything, but anyone today can actually release an NFT of the Mona Lisa because the Mona Lisa, the IP is actually in public domain. Okay. Uh, Cause it's so old and obviously it's been way more than 50 years since Leonardo da Vinci died. Um, so the Mona Lisa is in public domain. So, I could go to OpenSea and I could take a picture that I found online of the Mona Lisa and I could mint it as an NFT and I can sell it. And then the Louvre, which houses the actual Mona Lisa, can do the exact same thing. And maybe the picture is exactly the same. The fidelity is exactly the same. Quality of the picture, the JPEGs, is exactly the same. It's just that the certificate pointing to one of them has my name on it. I'm the issuer. I'm a nobody. And then the other one, has a Louvre. This is a this is an official, uh, you know, NFT of the Mona Lisa issued by the organization that actually owns the physical Mona Lisa. Which NFT do you think is going to be worth more? Of course, the original. Of course, right. right? Well, I mean, well, it's what, technically not the what original. you just described. I mean, what you just described is a replica. Yes, but but isn't is, I mean, I guess that's the point, right? Is that if you just copy and save, right click, save a board ape. And you parade it around, and people have done this just to troll, right? Board ape, board ape owners have, are kind of sensitive about their IP and their their uh, their actual apes, and so plenty of people have trolled the uh, really kind of uh, reflexive uh, ape owners by 
taking their ape and stealing it and putting it as their PFP on Twitter, right? And tweeting at them. By the end of the day, right? If, if you don't have the certificate, if the certificate doesn't say that you own it, it's not really worth anything. So I, I, think, that's, I think that's why it was pretty interesting when Twitter release a new feature that allows you to actually verify that if you use a PF, you know, an actual NFT PFP for your profile pick, you can actually connect that to the blockchain and verify that it is, you know, my NFT, right? So it gives you a, a slightly different view, right? Shape um, to verify it. You can click on it and actually see the on-chain metadata. Um, so this deters a lot of people that are out there that want to simply like right-click save and then change my own PFP into that thing that you just bought. All right, let's let's go to the third myth because we are going to talk about rights. The third myth that we've all heard, NFTs have no commercial rights. NFTs come with no commercial rights. Now, let me take this one very, uh, very briefly. Um, this is completely incorrect. This is an absolute myth. And we've already established what an NFT actually is, right? It's We're talking about NFT being... Uh, the certificate, and then there is an underlying asset. So what we're actually talking about, we're talking about rights, is the rights pertaining to that underlying asset. Okay? Now, there are four primary, or normally there are four different types of rights that come with NFTs. The first is just the default rights of that image or that, uh, that media. Okay? Um, and those rights are give the owner of the NFT personal use and display. And unless that underlying asset is in the public domain, like the Mona Lisa, um, you can't do much else with it by default. And that's just a default creator rights, right? When you buy a painting of a, an artist that is still alive or one that has died, but you know, died less than 50 years ago, um, what you own is you own the physical painting. But you can't actually, just because you have this physical painting, regardless of how expensive it is, hanging in your house, you can't do anything else really with that image. Okay, the actual artist or the artist's estate still owns the creative rights and the commercialization rights to that image, to that piece of art. Same thing here. By default, that is what you get for your NFT, personal use and display for the underlying asset, but nothing else. The second category of rights are limited commercial rights. And CryptoKitties, which were the early versions of you know, an NFTs, what Dapper Labs got, was founded on, they use a limited commercial rights uh, license called the NFT license. You can find out nftlicense.org. Now, this is a very unpopular license now. So very, very few projects actually lean on this kind of license anymore. It's, it, it feels outdated. That license allows the owner um, of the NFT to commercialize the underlying asset for merchandise up to $100,000 US per year, but nothing more. And more importantly, actually limits on other ways to commercialize your NFT. You cannot create derivatives of the underlying asset or art, uh, and you cannot use your NFT to endorse other products. So what we've seen the uh, Bored Apes do, you know, using Bored Apes to endorse, I don't know, like M&Ms and whatnot, uh, you can't do that with CryptoKitties under these limited commercial rights. The third type of right, are full commercial rights. This is what Bored Apes have. That's why the Bored Ape Yacht Club became so special. Uh, one of the first true blue chip collections that have full commercial rights, which means that the Bored Ape owners, the ones that own the certificate, can do what they wish with the underlying asset. They can make it into movies and uh, TV shows and make music with it and uh, you know get it signed by a, right, uh, you know, a, a talent agency and whatnot and use it to promote all sorts of stuff. Okay. But here's the thing, and this is sort of the big controversy that's been brought up in the last week. A number of people are starting to point out that if you read the fine print, you have to realize that these full commercial rights are still a license, which technically means that Yuga Labs, which is the creator of Board A, at any point can pull that license. Now, Yuga Labs has said they're never going to do that. But technically, the thing, the legal document that gives you the full commercial rights for your Board A, it's still just a license. Okay, so it's licensed to you. And then finally, the fourth type, which is now the trend, is called CC0 or Creative Commons Zero, um, also known as No Rights Reserved. That's a No Rights Reserved uh, Creative Commons license. It means there's nada. Anyone can do anything with the, uh, the creative, 
right? This is the new trend. Still hotly debated on whether or not it's good or bad. One of the first successful uh, CC0 NFT collections is called MFers. It was a stick figure. And it was given CC0 rights uh, specifically because they wanted the creator, the pseudonymous creator named Sartoshi, wanted it to be used in memes. In fact, the stick figure started off as a stick figure meme and uh, and they wanted it to be just used as so so he just gave away or she I don't know uh, if Sartoshi's a man or woman gave away these rights. Uh, more recently, Moonbirds Malcolm's Moonbirds collection um, switched from having full commercial rights to CC Zero, which in this scenario because it launched with full commercial rights and Malcolm bought it while it had full commercial rights, actually mean that rights are suddenly taken away from the owner. Right, so Malcolm previously, he could sue people. Tech, I mean, technically, I, again, no precedent yet, but he could go and sue somebody who's taken his wizard hat Moonbird and tried to pr- use it to, you know, commercialize it in some way. Now with CC zero, he no longer can. So, Malcolm, I actually want you to to respond to this because it's hotly debated in the Moonbird's community. What are your personal thoughts about the fact that your full commercial rights were taken away by Kevin Rose? Yeah, I'm a little bit torn by this um, because on the one hand, CC0 is great because it allows you to, you know, it allows the the, the community and the crowd out there to build up your brand. So um, I think this happened in in, in the case of MFers, right, where the, the brand itself grew because other people created derivatives of it that became popular. And so therefore, if you're a Moonburst holder, and people out there create derivatives of it that become uh, popular and successful, then of course your Moonbird's brand will be lifted. But the flip side to this is also true, right? If if people out there go create like a Moonbird's branded restaurant or I don't know, coffee brand, and it actually sucks, right? That means it can hurt the brand as well. And so I think that's the thing that's um, interesting with CC0. But with Moonbird specifically, I think the the whole debate was that this actually created they announced this switch right as a surprise i mean a lot of folks were surprised and taken aback by this and they felt therefore cheated because their rights were were sort of taken away yeah i I have a personal experience where i bought into a uh, cc0 um, nft collection just because i wanted to see what it feels like to own a cc0 nft the collection i bought into um that i minted is called the rotten antisocial club and D-dubs, you can, I'll, I'll send you, I'll, I'll steal my own NFT and let you uh, put it, slap it on the podcast uh, to show what it looks like. It's just what, what, in the, what in the community is called a piece of trash, right? I, I, I own three pieces of trash. And uh, it's completely countercultural. The entire meme of this uh, collection is that it's supposed to go down to zero for, for a floor price. The goal is to get it down to zero so that the entire collection is worth absolutely nothing. And the funny thing is, from the get-go, the very first things that the creator did was after uh, everyone minted it, it got minted out, and then after all of our trash got revealed, the first challenge that they put out there was somebody needs to go and try and create a derivative of uh, of you know one piece of trash and try and sell it uh, to be worth to make it worth more than the actual original. That was the challenge, right? So they're really testing the limits of CC0. And, uh, and the derivative artwork that have come out of these challenges is really, really cool. But there are people now that are directly right-clicking and saving um, you know, the, these, these PFPs and putting them back on OpenSea and, and trying to sell them at a higher price than the original is being listed for. So uh, we'll see how CC0 works for this. I think because this specific collection has really leaned hard into the CC0 kind of identity and concept, I think it'll be a lot of fun to be a part of it. Okay, we are going to go to our last myth for today. There are plenty of others, but this is another big one uh, that I think we should address. The last one for today, NFTs are bad for the environment. NFTs are bad for the environment. How many times have you guys heard that? I, I know somebody, an entrepreneur in the space uh, here in Hong Kong, someone I, I respect greatly. But the thing I can't stand is every single time they talk about their company, because they chose a blockchain that is not Ethereum to build on, they chose a non-Ethereum layer one, they always refer to themselves as a carbon neutral or environmentally friendly NFT project or platform. 
is, is that true? Is that not true? Uh, I, I do think actually this is a tech question. We kind of started addressing it last time we were talking about Ethereum and how Ethereum works. So Malcolm, let's come to you first. NFTs are bad for the environment, myth or truth? Uh, a little bit of yes and no, but mostly, you know, I think NFTs for the most part, um, you see uh, Ethereum based NFTs, although there's uh, a lot of Solana based NFTs are gaining popularity. But I think when people think of NFTs, they, they, they're talking about Ethereum. And Ethereum currently has a carbon emission, I think, equivalent to, to effectively the country of Singapore. And so, yes, there's, there's some concern there, especially if um, Ethereum scales to where it you know, promises or wants to scale to. However, NFTs in particular, right, actually only represent 2% of the gas fee consumption on Ethereum. And so, you know, although there's other non-Ethereum blockchains that NFT uh, um, uses, in the grand scheme of things, and relatively speaking, NFTs itself, not really that bad for the environment. But I actually think this, this whole point is actually moot because Ethereum, as you know, is moving towards a proof of stake, you know, mechanism here from proof of work. And this will actually create 99.95% less energy being consumed. Um, because of it. So um, when they do the merge and when they actually move to proof of, of stake, um, you know, this this point will actually be moved. S Suresh, um, in the Web3 Marketing Association, when you talk to senior marketers, yourself included, uh, who are thinking about entering into the Web3 world and experimenting with NFTs or the metaverse, how often does uh, sustainability come up? It's front and center for brands right now, Gary. There are lots of brands who are uh, who want to be part of either net zero or they're trying to figure out how can they accelerate their own uh, getting to getting to a better carbon footprint how can they manage their supply chain um, this is this is sort of the, it it is probably in the zeitgeist more now than ever and increasingly we 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 talk about gen z's and as as an audience in this podcast all the time uh, increasingly, Gen Zs are saying we want to be, um, you know, working with, working for, buying goods from organizations and brands that have a better societal footprint through the three P bottom line, right? Profit, planet, um, and people. And and somewhere um, this this hasn't at this point in time, Web three feels like a bit of a wild west. NFTs, no one really knows what's going on from a sustainability perspective. But the counter argument to this is very simple, which is at least with NFTs, you're able to measure uh, how much gas fees, how much how much burn rate, what actually happened from a carbon footprint perspective versus if you are buying, let's go back to the first question around NFT art. If you're buying a piece of art from France that got on a plane and came to you, uh, you know, or, or you bought, I mean, it, it went. It's it's a 200 year old piece. It's been flying on planes all over. It's been it's been preserved in a certain temperature. And who is how is anybody ca counting uh, the carbon footprint of the Mona Lisa, for example, right? So so um, I think I think it's a bit of a what is measured gets treasured, but what is measured also gets the brick bats. Uh, I, I would rather have measurements in place, I think. It's my personal view as a CMO. Um, and uh, the, the opportunity here is to try and get to making the system better um, than than just saying NFTs are bad for the environment as we are trying to myth bust here, right? Man, D-Dubs didn't give you a ding on that. I would have given you a ding. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, well, gentlemen, thank you for this awesome conversation. Uh, we talked about four different myths uh, about the NFT today. NFTs are just JPEG art. We decided that's a myth. Um, it's not. In fact, NFTs themselves are the certificate that point to some kind of asset. And at this point, NFTs can now function in so many other ways and create so many new economies and so many different types of assets beyond just ownership of art. The second myth we talked about, anybody can copy and save an NFT. Uh, much like the same an the, the answer that we gave to the first one, obviously a myth. And more importantly, uh, even if you do right click and save an image, that certificate is what gives it authenticity, what provides the scarcity, and therefore what, what 
that certificate is what imbues a piece of digital art with intrinsic value. So even if you right click and save, just like if you were to, you know, create a random NFT or just, uh, you know, own a picture of the Mona Lisa, it's not going to be worth as much as an official Mona Lisa NFT uh, that is issued by the Louvre. The third myth we tackled, NFTs have no commercial rights. I hope that after my professorial explanation of rights uh, that you'll, you'll, you'll see that this isn't completely incorrect, that NFTs do uh, or can actually have rights. Uh, and increasingly, more and more blue chip NFT collections have commercial rights. Um, but there's also this trend towards CC0, CC0 where no rights are reserved and anyone can do anything. And it's still uh, TBD, whether or not that's a good thing for the artist and for the communities that are rallying around it. And finally, the fourth myth that we tackled, NFTs are bad for the environment. Uh, Malcolm explained to us that the carbon emissions for ETH are actually an issue. They are the equivalent to uh, the carbon emissions for the entire country of Singapore. Uh, we also, by the way, know that uh, Bitcoin and crypto mining in general, until the ban in China, uh, was the ninth most polluting city, if it were a, a, a city by itself, in all of China. That's a huge deal. So Blockchain technologies that are proof of work really do have a carbon emission problem. But within that world, the blockchain world, NFTs only represent a tiny percentage of gas fees. Ethereum's merge is going to significantly reduce the energy consumption of uh, consensus on that chain anyway. And then as Suresh very uh, importantly pointed out, there is a carbon footprint of visiting art around the world that is never calculated. And so having access to NFT or digitized version of the art might actually be significantly better for our environment in the long term. Whew. This was a long one. This was an important one. It was a good one. It was good enough that D-Dubs did not give anyone a buzz today. Okay, D-Dubs was very, very nice in his judgment today. There were three dings, one coerced, but three dings. <laughs> And, uh, and zero buzzes for today's conversation. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for teaching us about NFTs today. This has been Web3 and Whiskey. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite audio channel. And if you don't mind our unattractive mugs, go smash the like and subscribe button on YouTube. And please also subscribe to my daily, not daily, oh, thank goodness it's not daily. Please subscribe to my weekly departures newsletter that further explores Web3 innovations and provides explainers for the enterprise world. Join us next week for more Web3 debates and more whiskey. I'm Gary Liu. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.